Welcome back. So hopefully you began this module by going and looking at that website. Um, it showed you five different ways to introduce a speech and hopefully reinforce to you from an outside source other than your textbook and I how important grabbing your audience attention is. Uh, hopefully nobody's going to get punched, but you do want to open with a bang and some of the ways that he utilized in that blog entry I thought were very useful. I also have a book of his called Presentation Zen that I highly recommend if you are uh, particularly for going into sales or um, business of some kind. So when you're introducing a speech there are two types of questions. There's a rhetorical question and then there is a direct question. A rhetorical question is meant to stimulate your thoughts. So here we have, what do you do when a cashier hands you more money in change than you receive? Now, that's personal. What do you do? It's hypothetical. It's a situation that may or may not have happened to you. So in nature, we're just trying to stimulate your brain and get your wheels turning. But, and those are good, rhetorical questions have their place, particularly with sensitive material, especially if you're going to talk about, um, you know, something that's touchy for people. Uh, let me give you an example. So say I'm going to talk to young mothers um, about breastfeeding. Okay, it's I don't want to point to someone and say how's your breastfeeding going? I mean that's very a personal thing. I would need to sort of um, pose things more hypothetically so that I can protect my audience from adverse consequences. I don't want them to have to feel put on the spot or stuck in the limelight. So I might refer to the hypothetical or to the rhetorical in that situation. And this is probably something that you've studied in your English class or your speech class in high school, but uh, there are times for hypothetical and rhetorical, but there are also times to be direct. Because when we're direct, we can have a show of hands. When we're direct, uh, we put people in the real world as opposed to the hypothetical world. So asking someone, how many of you, how many of you is insinuating maybe a show of hands? And I might even say, how many of you by a show of hands would return to the store to give back an extra dollar? or two that you received. And so it is still a hypothetical situation, but I'm asking for a show of hands now. <sighs> people may or may not raise their hand, right? Uh, people may not say what you expect them to say, but that gets some participation from your audience. Here's another example of a rhetorical question. Do you remember how the Ark of the Covenant was depicted in George Lucas's film Raiders of the Lost Ark? It was in the Indiana Jones series. Nobody? Da, 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 da. Um, so I do, obviously, because uh, I could change that to a direct question by saying, how many of you? Right? So just tagging that, how many of you, at the beginning of the sentence, it asks my audience for an overt response. Either I call on them to answer the question or a show of hands. Now, remember in my class, I'm going to ask you not necessarily to have a verbal conversation with the audience. We're, we want to have a nonverbal relationship with the audience while we're speaking for our allotted time. Um, because remember, if we actively get them speaking and get them contributing, we can't have as predictable of a time measurement, which is what we need in order to be finished in eight minutes. Um, and that's once again just for the purposes of our class. If you're going to go to speak in a small group, I highly recommend a conversation at the beginning of your presentation rather than just a hypothetical or a show of hands. But for the purposes of our class, we're going to do just hypothetical show of hands type um, questions. Now, here's another tricky thing about show of hands. It can be abused in that if you don't actually wait to survey the room and look around and see who is raising their hand and who isn't, then it can come off as very fake, right? It's like when people walk up to you and they say, how's your day? And they keep going, 
right? <laughs> they don't actually wait to see how you are, right? It feels a little bit fake. So we want to look around the room, maybe even count the number of hands, because it will inform, say, for your demonstration speech, you're going to teach us how to throw a football. And you start your speech with, how many of you have thrown a football before? and three people raise their hand and you move on without seeing that then when you need a volunteer for somebody to help demonstrate with you it might have been a good choice to choose one of those three people who raise their hand so that's just an example of using that data and surveying the class and we'll talk more about that when we cover chapter five uh, not next lesson but the next so a good introduction. Uh, one other way, if you don't want to do the show of hands, another way to do this is to engage our imagination, right? Take us to a fantasy world or take us to a recreation of where you were. Um, I think this particularly works well with children. Stimulate our curiosity. This is one of the reasons that jokes are often good because we're waiting for that punchline. We're waiting for the end of the puzzle. Some people might open a lesson with a riddle, write it on the board, and then maybe by the end you reveal the riddle. Now once again, <laughs> we can open and introduce and get people's attention, but we don't want to... Um, we don't want to overshadow the rest of our speech. If people are spending the whole time trying to figure out your riddle, they're not going to be able to pay attention. So um, we do want to stimulate their curiosity, but we don't want to go over the top with it. I can't keep this slide up for much longer because I know it's more interesting than I am. But if you can promise us health, wisdom, uh, that it's going to make us thinner or smarter, we're more likely to pay attention to your speech just out of self-interest. Remember, in most cases, people aren't against you, but they are for themselves. <laughs> and if it's more to their own self-interest to think about their grocery list rather than to engage with you in your speech, uh, their grocery list might win. So appeal to their own self-interest. People are for themselves. All right, page 132, we are talking about why even bother to have an introduction. Why should I even bother to introduce? I've, I've only got eight minutes. I got to jump in on my contact. Well, it's going to actually save you time to have a good introduction rather than to jump in. First of all, you need to have one topic. Okay, I, you need to have your scope of your argument narrowed in on before you start your speech, right? So, for example, last week I said Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a poet and a prophet. Now those are two sub points, but I have picked one person to pay tribute to. Um, I want you want to establish the importance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, for me, I think that's pretty. He has a holiday named after him, <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't feel as much of a need to establish his importance. Hopefully he's already somebody that people see as important, um, but he won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he's an author. He led the civil rights movement. And then what is my credibility? What is my ethos? Obviously, I am not African American, right? And so I might be tempted to shy away from talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saying, well, I don't really know what it was like in that civil rights movement. Uh, but I, I wouldn't do that because I believe in solidarity. Solidarity is one of those $50 words <laughs> that means I am going to stand with a person who I think is on the side of justice. I'm going to stand with a person who I think is on the, on the side of righteousness or justice. So. I will stand with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. even though um, I was not there in the 1960s and obviously I wasn't oppressed. I think that I am credible to speak about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because I've studied him both academically and spiritually personally. So. And your intro should always preview what you're going to talk about. So remember I said your thesis ought to have uh, your main ideas in it. So I said Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a poet and a prophet. Those are previewing my main points. All right, moving on to a conclusion. Uh, 
And as always, I'm just assuming that you've read the chapter once you've watched this lecture. So um, no, I'm not going into a lot of detail. Uh, please go back and read the chapter for yourself. Concluding a speech. We want to summarize those key events. Right? So I would end my speech by saying Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was both a poet and a prophet. Now, you may be saying to yourself, isn't that redundant? You said that in your opening. You went over how he was a poet and then you went over how he was a prophet. Then you're going to end it by saying that for the third time? And your English teacher would probably highlight that and say, you're saying that same thing too much, but... As we'll get to later in this lecture, you want to say what you're going to say, tell us, and then tell us what you told us. Remember, I, I think I actually put that in the last lecture. Tell us what you're going to tell us, tell us, and then tell us what you told us. Repetition, repetition, repetition. How many times in the I Have a Dream speech did Dr. M Martin Luther King Jr. say, I have a dream? It's because he needed his audience in that big, huge outdoor space with all of the hustling and bustling and the million men that were there for marching and women too. Uh, but he needed them to know at the end of his speech, if they didn't take away anything else, it was that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had hope for the future, right? So summarize that key event even at the end of your speech. I know it feels redundant but people need to hear it over and over and over again before it really sinks in. It's not the same as reading in a book where you can go back and reread if you get behind. Another thing you may want to put in your conclusion is some sort of activation for audience response. So I might encourage you at the end of my Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to go read uh, Letters from Birmingham Jail if you've never read it before, or to go YouTube some different speeches and watch them. Uh, maybe you haven't even ever seen the I Have a Dream speech. I might encourage you to go read that. Of course, another purpose of a conclusion is to provide closure. We want to start to use our voice to indicate that we're through. We want to put it all back in the box psychologically. Um, <laughs> Here's another trick. The conclusion only needs to be, I mean, 30 seconds to a minute in the, because you're only speaking for three to five minutes for your tribute speech. So we don't need to drag out that conclusion, right? Once again, my father is a Southern Baptist minister, and, and sometimes we would sing just as I am 15 times. <laughs> right? Dragging out that um, altar call for, at the end of the service. We want to, when we're speaking, we don't want to drag out the altar call. We want to make sure that we are restating our points. We're maybe tacking in one piece of new information, but we're not overloading our conclusion with new information. It's mostly just a summary. So you'll notice on your outline, there's not actually a place for your conclusion. That's because there's not really supposed to be any new information. It's supposed to just be summative. Your introduction ought to be those first three things on your outline, and then your conclusion also ought to be summative. It's not a place to include new information. Uh, so don't put it on your outline. And I already said that, put it all together. So there's a special term for something that you've probably heard a hundred times, which is a circular conclusion. A circular conclusion. And that just means that we're going to refer to something at the beginning and then refer to it again in the conclusion. So I might open, as I did last week, with the idea that I am standing on the shoulders of giants. And that quote, um, to me means that uh, as I draw on historical great speakers, then I am learning to be a great speaker. And so then during my speech, I might refer to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a poet, as a prophet. And then in the end, for my conclusion, I might show you this monument from the Washington Mall um, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is uh, standing larger than life. He is a giant in that monument. So it's sort of a play on my intro that you saw on my outline. Does that make sense? So 
circular, it refers back to the introduction. So you might open with a quote and then end with a picture that references back to that quote. You might open with a rhetorical question and then end by commenting um, back on that question, whether how many hands were raised, or does that make sense? So it's just kind of circular in nature. Please don't confuse that with a circular argument. We'll talk about that when we talk about persuasive speaking. Circular arguments are bad. <laughs> circular conclusions are good. So they add a sense of putting it back in the box together, like we said in the last slide. All right, so we're skipping chapter 10 because we already covered that last week. Sorry. I'm saying not chapter 10, chapter 11. Moving on to page 153, using language correctly. I love that in your book that it has there the example of the long-term monotonous relationship and they actually meant to say monogamous relationship. I had a similar situation with one of my first debates that I staged at Motlow. Um, they had chosen to speak about sexual education but I could tell it was kind of uncomfortable for them to talk about that and um, instead of saying contraceptives, right, condoms, birth control, uh, the student kept saying contrapositives. <laughs> so anytime you're going to use a word, make sure you know how to say it, make sure you feel comfortable saying it. Now, that said, this little guy in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, his name is Henry Higgins. He is a character in a musical, My Fair Lady. Uh, My Fair Lady is set in London, and there are people with Cockney accents. Oh, lots of chocolates for me to eat. Right, she's got that. Oh, it's real heavy and Russell Brand kind of talks like this. So you can't really understand what he's saying, right? <laughs> um, and, and George Bernard Shaw, when he wrote this play originally, the heroine of our story, uh, played by Audrey Hepburn, she starts off as someone who speaks in a Cockney accent and then Henry Higgins the guy in the bottom left hand corner he fixes her he becomes her pet project and this is based on a Greek myth Pygmalion um, where a sculptor falls in love with his sculpture now the reason that I bring up Pygmalion is that Henry Higgins wanted to fix Audrey Hepburn's character, right? He wanted to fix the flower girl. She was poor and he wanted to make her pass for upper class citizen. And how did he do that? He did that by changing her voice. And it's no mystery to us in the South. If you meet somebody, you can kind of tell their social status based on their voice, right? If I come in and I say, hi, I'm Emily Seal, I'm from Cowan, and we have cows, <laughs> right? Uh, I am talking, and I am, you're listening, and together, we all know that I'm from Cowan, <laughs> right? Do you say Shebville, or do you say Shelbyville, right? So, uh, there's a certain vocal social status. Now, if I walk in and I say, hello, I'm from Georgia, and I am a Georgia peach, and there's a good chance that I come from old money. <laughs> okay, I've just started playing at this point, but I want you to realize that the diction and your articulateness and the way that you choose to speak, there will be Henry Higgins in the world. Now, let me tell you the difference between the book and the movie. The book by George Bernard Shaw, he is actually, at the end, she decides that Henry Higgins is a jerk and she leaves him because he was, he was dating her as a fixer-upper. He was turning her into something that she wasn't. He was trying to pass her off for something that she wasn't. And at the end of the play, she actually realized, you know what, there's nothing wrong with my voice and there's nothing wrong with who I am. Now that she could speak, quote, properly, she could get a job, which was good before she didn't have a job because no one would hire her because you couldn't even understand what she was saying from the way she was speaking. But in My Fair Lady, of course, the Hollywood version, they end up together. 
But it's worth saying that I do think the Henry Higgins of the world, who would judge me if I walk in and say, hi, I'm Emily and I'm from Cannes, <laughs> you know, they, I think, aren't fair. I don't, I'm not endorsing the Henry Higgins perspective. But I do need you to know that they're out there. Hypothetical situation. You're a nurse in a hospital and you walk in to um, speak to a doctor and that doctor is maybe from a foreign country and you have such a heavy accent that he can't understand what you're saying. Now he's not really being a Henry Higgins in that situation. It really is harder as a second language learner to understand people who are using words that are vernacular, the vernacular sort of um, not standardized. So as a theater person, I had to study American standard English. And that's something that like a newscaster would use or that if you were in the south or if you were in the north or if you were in the east or the west coast, no matter where you are in America, you can understand that person speaking. So, I hesitate to teach about this because there are Henry Higgins out there and I don't want to be mistaken for one. I want you to know that your voice has personality, your voice is your roots, your voice is, uh, tells a lot about yourself. But I also need you to be articulate and part of my job is making sure that you're grammatically correct and that no matter where a person is from here in America that they can understand you speaking. Okay, so whew. anyway, 154. Another thing that kind of comes across and hinders communication in language is jargon. Uh, something that hinders communication in language is jargon. So if I come in and I say, okay, we're going to get started on module number one. That's a teacher term. And when I say module number one, I just mean all the things that are in this curriculum unit. And I've had more than one student come to me and say, what's a module? <laughs> and I say, oh, yeah, sorry, teacher word. Uh, the same thing happens with the military often. If I'm trying to have a conversation with someone in the military, they start using all these acronyms that I, as a uh, lay person, a person who doesn't, who's not in the military, doesn't always understand. Uh, if, if you overhear a conversation between two military people, they can use all the jargon and the acronyms and the abbreviations. Um, but I am not, so it is humbling. Uh, so once again, you don't want to alienate people. If you're the person who's throwing out those acronym or jargon and you see that people don't understand what you're saying, back the train up, remind us what that cert stands for. Even people think, you know, ac letters after your name. I'm Emily Seal and I have an MFA. Well, you might not know that an MFA stands for a Master's of Fine Arts degree. You know, if you're introducing yourself as a nurse and you say, I have a CRN, well, someone who's not also in the medical field might not know that. You may want to take just a second to say, I'm a certified nurse. It's cool. I can take your blood. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so try to avoid acronyms. Try to avoid jargon uh, when you're speaking publicly. That doesn't mean after you get to know somebody in your institution or in your business that you don't then go back to that acronym or that abbreviation, but especially in those introductory weeks or those introductory conversations, jargon, acronyms, abbreviations, those tend to hinder communication. So dancing into another sort of sensitive word choice conversation. We don't want to give away our power we don't want to give away our power and it can be tempting as a public speaker to want to be humble which is good but if you go into a speech and you say I don't know I think well maybe I could be wrong um, do you guess is it okay am I okay is this okay that tone repeatedly in your speech, it can be exhausting to us as an audience member, okay? You need to be positive. You need to be sure of yourself. You need to pick a topic that you believe in and you can stand behind. You need to stand tall when you speak and speak in clear, resonant, and dulcet tones. We don't need to try to pull your speech out of you. 
We don't need to hear all these apologetic statements. We don't want to wade through all of your hesitancy to get to the point. When you give a speech, it's a time to be courageous. It's a time to be bold. It's a time to express yourself confidently. We want to avoid cliches. I've hardly, no, I can say, the whole time I've worked at Motlow, I've never heard a good speech about please stop smoking. Because we've all heard the ads. We've all spoken with people who should stop smoking. I rarely hear a good speech about how to lose weight. uh, Because often people are just quoting cliches to me, right? Oh, you should eat more vegetables and go for walks. (laughs) Oh, really? Okay. Uh, (laughs) Not to be rude. That's mean. Uh, But but what I'm saying is you need to have original thoughts and you need to not pick the lowest hanging fruit. So maybe you want to talk about smoking. What can we talk about instead? Maybe you want to talk about e-cigarettes and um, vaping right? That's a new trend. That's something different that people are probably interested in. Maybe you want to talk about the legalization of marijuana. That is a little more intricate and not quite as condescending to us. Uh, We want to pick the, not pick the lowest hanging fruit. We want to not just recite these simplicities or cliches because it's condescending to our audience. We want to not talk down to them. So the last thing, it was kind of don't talk over their heads. This one is don't talk down to your audience. Remember that we're college educate. We're working on our, they're working on their college education. So speak to them as collegiate audience that has gotten here because they've made certain grades on their ACT. They have a certain level of education. They presumably either have their GED or their high school diploma. So don't feel like you need to condescend to us as your audience. We are an educated base, which means for many of you that we need to step it up a level. We need to introduce college level words. We need to use some poetry. We got to bulk up a little bit. <laughs> okay, this is from the pictures from the Nashville Shakespeare Company. I, I love going to see Shakespeare in the park, and I just think it's so cute that they have sunglasses on William Shakespeare. But remember, you as a public speaker may be as poetic as you like. I had a question during my mud time that you know about because you're in my class but when I take up questions and and people kind of ask me about their insecurities and I uh, the question was from he or she I don't know it was anonymous what if I sound too poetic (laughs) there's no such thing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he composed I Have a Dream I don't think he was worried about sounding too poetic right use all the imagery use repetition use antithesis use all of these great poetry words that you learned about in English class I think that it's a wonderful thing to have a poetic speech so a tone is kind of the relationship that you come about with your language and with your grammar there's a famous sermon called sinners in the hands of an angry god right and there's all of this language about a you know you're you're on this web and you could fall through and it's just very threatening language so when we study the tone of past sermons past speeches there are some that have a more serious and angry tone and there are more that are more lighthearted now, as I've already kind of established, your first speech was lighthearted in tone, and your tribute speech ought to be, in some cases, more serious. It doesn't have to be, but for sure when you get to your informative speech, it needs to be more serious in tone. It needs to be very factual and full of information, so we want to honor the tone of that. What's so tricky about tone? It's your fight or flight reflex. Some of you are naturally more aggressive. I would tend to fall in the fight category and sometimes I can end up pushing and yelling at my audience because I get excited. (laughs) Some of you 
you for your tone you're a flight person or a freeze person and so you tend to shy away and speak too quietly and so it can be tricky finding your tone but you can start to set your tone with your word choice don't be tempted to fall into the tone that often these 24-hour news cycles have right there's something that's going to kill you and you're probably going to eat it for dinner tonight at five <laughs> right <laughs> that tome is alarmist they're trying to ring the alarm bells to get your attention so we want to be nonviolent communicators we don't want to unnecessarily alarm our audience that doesn't mean that we don't ever alarm our audience because sometimes there are alarming things in the world but there's a small chance that what you're about to eat for dinner is going to kill you but the 24-hour news cycle they just want to sell you something right so watch your tone try not to be um, too aggressive or too passive so <laughs> this sounds bad but we do want to keep it simple keep it simple comma stupid this is uh, something they say in technology it's something they say in the business world it's something that we say in communications as well keep it simple if you can't un say it simply you probably don't understand it fully if you can't say it simply you probably don't understand it fully it probably means you need to go back to phase one again and start to narrow that scope Remember, your tribute speech is only three to five minutes, so it needs to be simple. We don't need to try to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to try to summarize a 500-word book into five minutes. <laughs> this is the time to go to the dictionary. This is the time to go to the encyclopedia.com and look at the short version of what you're talking about, not the exhaustively encyclopedia, big, huge version of what's going on. Keep it simple, okay? Use short sentences, use pronouns, use familiar language. We want to make it understandable. It's that same thing we talked about last lesson about throwing all that food on a plate. We don't want to do that. We don't want the mashed potatoes to touch the steak. We want to keep everything organized and simple and clear. If you turn in your thesis to statement to me in my class, I want it to be able to fit on a bumper sticker. Okay? doesn't mean that it's not profound it doesn't mean that it's not uh, got depth or full or richness right it just means that we have understand it so well that we can state it simply all right that's my lesson for today as always thank you for listening